It's Thursday, February 21st. Tonight, a profile of Beaufort County Community College next on North Carolina Now. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. The North Carolina Community College feature in this episode of North Carolina Now is produced by UNCTV in association with the North Carolina Community Colleges Foundation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shannon Vickery. Thanks for joining us tonight on North Carolina Now. We'll visit a carry based company that's come up with a unique solution for an itchy problem. And Rose Styron shares personal insights with us about her late husband, author William Styron. But we begin in Beaufort County. Our series of reports on the 50th anniversary of North Carolina's community colleges continues tonight with a profile of Beaufort County Community College. It has the largest service area of all the 58 community colleges in our state. To drive from Ocracoke at one end of this community to the campus in Little Washington is over four hours. It's not an easy task to bring education and job training to this region. That's where Rick Sullivan picks up the story. The challenges are how to deliver a quality education to people that can't drive in every day to come to class. You would automatically think that you could switch to online learning and that would be the answer, but most of these people do not have the high-speed internet to their homes. Beaufort County Community College battles these issues on a variety of fronts. The school offers three early college high schools scattered throughout their roughly 2,000 square mile service area. That reduces travel and tuition costs for high school students with college ambitions. BCCC offers students flexibility of schedule and notable value. A truck driving school on campus offers students training that can cost thousands of dollars elsewhere, but at a fraction of that here. And they can do that on weekends, so they can be employed somewhere and they can come out here on Friday, Saturday and Sunday and get their truck driver license. And we've just added a large commercial bus and so they can get their bus license as well. And there are jobs. Folks are finding jobs, we're finding that uh, that uh, probably 98% of the people that come through the course who want to work and want to go over the road are able to find uh, driving jobs uh, right after the class and in many cases they have their uh, job offers before the class ends. But uh, this is actually where we started day one back down here. We're actually going backwards right now. This part of it would be hard enough in my car. I've got blind spots. Well, believe it or not, the longer the trailer, the easier it is to buy. Starting pay for truck drivers can range from twenty-five to forty thousand dollars. The prerequisites for getting started are few. The biggest problem we have is right here. Stick shift? With that gear shift. We have people back in a trailer. They had never backed a trailer, and they've never drove a standard shift. An 18-week course will take care of that problem. Haywood Broom guarantees it. Matching programs to the needs of the community is something that BCCC has been doing since it was founded in 1967 as Beaufort County Technical Institute. The owner of Russell's Gentleman's Clothing in downtown Washington is a prime example. Russell Smith, a trustee of Beaufort County Community College, has owned this shop for more than 30 years. He got his head start into retail business with an associate's degree from Beaufort Tech in 1975. It was like a four-year business degree crammed into a two-year degree. It was actually a two-year and one-quarter program. There was a, go to school a quarter, then we'd go uh, work for a quarter. And uh, so you receive the classroom training and on-the-job instruction. And uh, a business like this, like I own, there's no way you can learn it in the classroom. And the first week I was in that clothing store, I knew that this was what I wanted to do. And I was trained by one of the best, how to talk to people, how to measure, how to buy, how to sell. And then I learned the rest of it in the classroom. It was just, it was an ideal situation. And I think that's what we try to do today 
at the community college. That's why I get so excited about it. I'm big about cooperative education. We want to, we want to produce the best nurses and best welders and best mechanics that we can. And so when there's a need, we try to fulfill that need. And there's no better way to learn than in the classroom and on the job training, hands-on experience. That's what it's all about. The Beaufort Tech business degree Mr. Smith earned in 1975 has gone the way of the old school name. And in most places, so is the level of customer service that is still available at his store. Business environments and communities change, and the community college programs change with them. Targeted new programs are coming online now at BCCC. I'm not going to add a training program that they can't get a job here. So we're closely trying to match those. And so we are adding new programs um, that they could complete and get a job. We're adding speech language pathology this coming fall. Uh, we believe we'll be approved to author, offer a health and fitness program for this fall. And uh, we've added massage therapy in February. We'll start this February. Those are programs we know there are jobs in this community. So that's, that's another plus for staying tuned in to our community and the economic development of the area. The strategic plan is in place, and so are the people who implement it. I like helping people. I love the college. The, the college, I refer to the college as the crown jewel in our neighborhood, and it is. It's, it's, it's a great place to be. It's accessible, it's affordable, and it helps people, and I like that. Our profiles of North Carolina's community colleges continue next week with a look at AB Technical Community College in Asheville. In statewide headlines, lawmakers are expanding the plan to give financial help to group home operators in North Carolina. The Senate Appropriations Committee agreed to legislation using $40 million set aside by legislators last summer to provide temporary financial assistance to group homes whose occupants were disqualified from Medicaid payments. The measure also allows payments to units treating dementia patients. The bill now goes to the full Senate. Now here's a look at tomorrow's weather. We'll see rain and freezing rain across the state for the end of the work week. Temperatures will be cold with highs mainly in the upper 30s to low 40s. Now here's a look at what happened on Wall Street today. Look back at some of the stories in the news in 2012, the election, the fiscal cliff, Superstorm Standy, the Olympics, and even Facebook going public. Chances are the bed bug epidemic might also make the list. At least 50 cities across the country are now reporting major infestations of bed bugs. The tiny, almost invisible creatures can live almost anywhere and leave nasty welts when they bite and feed. Bed bugs are not only difficult to find, but also to get rid of. Tonight, Frank Graff shows us a carry company that is developing a system using, using trained bugs to find bed bugs. And it turns out that those smart bugs could be put to other uses as well. On the second floor of a Cary office building, behind a sign that suggests high-tech science, you'll find the latest research into Micropletus crocepes. They use their antennae to pick up chemical signatures of anything they're looking for, whether it's food or some substance they don't like or... So that's anything what, in their environment. So that's what they're doing in their little cage. They're just kind of they're just kind of going around using their antennae, just kind of randomly moving around until they search, hit, find some food or something they like. That's right, Micropletus crocepes, otherwise known as sensor bugs. 
But before you call these just a bunch of dumb bugs, watch. From the air going in, does it take long? I'm, I'm kind of timing no, here. No, it takes about five seconds. And as you can see, they're already there. They're already gathering around the hole, um, thinking, there's a, thinking there's some food there. That's right. These bugs are trained. The bugs that we're using are very amazing. They're just as effective and sometimes more effective than dogs at being able to detect what it is they're trained to detect. So just like you can train a dog uh, to detect um, explosive residue or some other scent, we can train these bugs to do the same thing. The bugs and their sense of smell were first discovered in farm fields. It turns out that when an ear of corn is getting eaten by a caterpillar, it gives off a certain scent. The bugs, attracted to the scent, lay their larvae in the caterpillar, kill the caterpillar, and save the corn. And that got scientists thinking, wait a minute, everything gives off a scent. Think about it. Coffee sure does. So does candy. So does food when it's cooked. And even the wood, the paint all around us, it all gives off a scent. And that got people thinking, wait a minute, if the bugs could be attracted to the scent of corn, could they be attracted to the scent of everything else? Anything. A dog can be trained to smell, uh, your slippers, you know, the neighbor's cat, whatever. Anything that a dog can smell, these sensor bugs can smell. And so we started looking at, at the different application spaces. Bennett Aerospace is developing a device that would enable the bugs to detect odors along with software to monitor the bugs' behavior. We'll put the five sensor bugs in these cartridges. And these cartridges will snap into the lid and we'll put the lid back on and we'll turn the fan on and that'll pull in a certain mass flow rate that the bugs have been trained to detect um, a certain odor. Mm -hmm. And uh, within about five seconds, um, the bugs will congregate towards the center if there's a detection. The first target, bed bugs. The question, as company president Doug Bennett says in this video, is whether there is a market to support building and selling a product to spot bed bugs. Because right now there is no way of detecting if someone has bed bugs or not. The only reason the only way you can tell today is if someone starts getting bites on them and they don't really know where it's coming from um, or they might see a bed bug, but uh, because bed bugs are nocturnal, most people don't even know they're there. In theory, sensor bugs could be trained to detect any household problem and perhaps even explosives, illegal drugs, even human diseases. We would sell or lease the, the container. So the piece of the product that has the camera, that has the computer software, that has the fan to draw the air in, that's uh, constantly reusable. And then we would continue to train or rear train uh, and package the sensor bugs and then send out cartridges. Which begs the question you've probably been asking throughout this entire story, just how do you train a bug? Well, the company will only say training bugs is similar to training dogs. Food rewards are used. And if there's a chemical signature the bugs you know, have been trained to detect, they will gather around this hole where we're pumping air through. And, and they're thinking, oh, there's, there's, there's food, because they associate that smell with, um, with food that they're given when they're trained. It, it takes about two, just several minutes to train one of these bugs. Really? Yes, they're very, very easy and quick to train. In a room, well, about this size, so about the size of, a, of an average bedroom, uh, with two technicians, we can train thousands of sensor bugs a week, uh, 10,000 or more per week with two people. That's training. Bennett Aerospace is picking up on sensor bug experiments first conducted by the Pentagon and the U.S. Department of Agriculture almost 30 years ago. The company is turning to the growing phenomenon of crowdsourcing to measure public interest in the project and to raise money. To find out more, visit our website. When the town of Wake Forest had to take down some trees in one of their parks, a few town employees came up with a plan to create a public art project in order to give park goers a more enriching experience. After some input from the local arts council and some residents, the town found an artist who was a cut above the rest and commissioned him to work his magic on one of the old trees that had become a hazard to the park. There's an old question you may have heard. If a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, I don't know about that, but I do know that if a tree gets refashioned into something else, it does make a sound, a really loud one. So why is this person slicing and dicing this tree stump in a public park in the town of Wake Forest? 
the old tree had to be cut down. It was dropping branches. It looked like it had internal uh, decay in some of the upper parts of it. Um, so we looked at it and said, you know, to improve the pool, that this tree has to come out. But was there anything the town could do besides taking the tree completely out? I suggested that we do what a number of other towns have done and uh, turn it into a work of art. My idea was let's make it a contest to let citizens have a part in coming up with what it will be. A little girl presented this and um, so this is the drawing that we're working from. We're going to carve a sit-down bear right here on this stump. After going through a series of chainsaw carver candidates, Jerry Reed was hired, and it turned out to be one bear of a job. When you're working with a piece this size, you're, you're, you can't work off a stepladder because it's very dangerous with a chainsaw. So you gotta put up scaffolding, and, and as you're working on the bear, you work on the upper half when you're on the scaffolding, which is, this is about probably seven and a half, eight feet, and uh, then when you get down to about the five and a half foot, then you have to move the scaffolding and get off and then move everything and, and work on the bottom half. And then when you gotta go back to, you gotta keep going back and forth, it's just a lot more work. Carving out the figure is just the first part of Jerry's daily grind. And I take a grinder and I grind it and grind it down smooth and, and make sure everything's where it needs to be. Um, then I will come back and I'll hair it with a special technique um, of putting hair all over the bear and actually doing directional hair. Due to kind of a trade secret of Jerry's, we couldn't show you the hairing process. But when that was done, his wife Kate was on hand for the next step. Then you stain it and then let the stain dry for at least 24 hours and then come back with a spar exterior urethane. To see the progress that you've made in what, two days now? Two days. Two yeah. days. Wow. He's huge. He's a big bear. He's huge. Just imagine if his mouth was open and his teeth were showing. He wouldn't look very friendly. Now he looks like a big daddy bear that, you know, is kind of watching over the kids playing in the pool. And that's yeah. It. You know, I'm kind of glad we didn't do the teeth yeah. <laughs> because I was thinking maybe it might just scare the kids. It would. I'm <laughs> but he, he's a friendly bear now. He looks to be very friendly and huggable. Hugs are what these kids wanted. Isn't that cute? But they would have to grin and bear it for a while until the urethane dried. It's amazing and it looks so big and so lifelike, it really does. We're gonna take the pieces that we had remaining and we're gonna use those for alphabets, letters, numbers and shapes and other things in the park. So we're trying to reuse as much of this tree as we can. And after the benches were completed, Jerry's three and a half day project was over. Now it's up to the parks and rec staff to make the final preparations so that the new eight foot tall friendly bear can quietly oversee the activities in Holding Park. For more information about the town of Wake Forest or Jerry's wood carvings, visit our website. The late author William Styron was one of the most flamboyant literary figures of the 20th century. He is perhaps best known for his novels Lie Down in Darkness and the Pulitzer Prize winning Confessions of Nat Turner. Now a new book gives us an up close and personal look at the author. UNCTV's D.G. Martin sat down with Rose Styron to talk about the selected letters of William Styron.